Give a warm welcome to Stefan Peininger as the first part of the double feature. And because this is a double feature, I get asked to please don't walk around while this talk. Please watch all the two series and enjoy it. So, let's start with the first part. To my right, it's Steffen Peininger. You all know him from the Freibrenner podcast. So, give him a warm welcome and start with the show. I graduated master distiller from uh, the Institute for Fermentation and Biotechnology in Berlin. I am also the fifth generation uh, distiller of our family company's distill. So uh, please don't diss all the commercial alcohol producers per se, because that's how I do my living. And um, we're going to talk today about, uh, well, alcohol production, uh, boost production, high, uh, high strength quality production, that is. And um, distilling is only one way of producing uh, hard liquor. Let me show you the other three types. The first types are liqueurs that you all know. Liqueurs are basically not distilled. They use uh, already made neutral grain spirits that come from large, uh, large alcohol refineries that are usually not distilled and it's perfectly legal to make liqueurs at home. Just buy yourself some vodka and flavor this vodka with whatever you fancy. I've got a nice uh, mate liqueur recipe for you later on. Um, so we have non-distilled spirits, most of them are liqueurs, some are gin, some are vodka and we have the field of distilled spirits. Most gins are distilled, most vodka are distilled. Their basis is always neutral grain spirits, so spirits made from grain. They are flavored, they are distilled, and the distillation itself here in Germany is legal, but you have to register and license your still. And then we have the third part and the most, well, the most true to the fruit part. That is where we do not actually buy pre-produced neutral grain spirits, but we make the alcohol ourselves via fermentation with yeast. So we produce the alcohol by fermentation ourselves, we distill it ourselves, but we need a license for that, otherwise it's illegal. But on the other hand, of course, the right one is the most fun to do. So how do we actually produce alcohol? Well, alcohol is usually or always produced by taking sugar, sugar as the basis or the fuel for our biochemical reaction we want to achieve, and our little tiny helpers, the yeast. Yeast cells, uh, some kind of fungus, they break down the sugar and they transform it into alcohol via, via alcoholic fermentation. This uh, you know all from your chemistry or biology, biology classes. And how do you make this? Well, we need this sugar. This sugar somehow converted to alcohol. Where do we get this sugar from? The traditional German way is making fruit spirits. And fruit spirits have the advantage that the mash, that is basically the, the stuff where the yeast makes the alcohol from, already contains sugar. So sugar is what we need. Usually it's a fruit juice or a smoothie from apples, pears, plums, cherries, you name it. So, we make a fruit juice or a smoothie out of it. Why? Because the yeast works best in a liquid environment. It also has some other uh, pros. The mesh is easier to pump and easier to measure. And uh, you have to always take into consideration that you use the best fruits available. Only the best fruits give you the best uh, taste and scent. And there I have to add, supermarket quality fruit is not necessarily the best. Best is usually baby food grade, but baby food grade uh, fruits you can't buy in the supermarket, sadly. 
so, so much about the quality of our food in our supermarkets. Um, then, if you prepare such a mash, you take, the, you take the fruits, you make a smoothie out of it with a blender, or you press it to choose, and then you check your acidity, because yeast works best in an acidity of a pH 3 to 3.4. The other reason is that uh, in such an acidic environment, bacteria that might consume our sugar and do not uh, ferment it into alcohol uh, doesn't, uh, is not active anymore. Okay, if we have a higher pH, we use just citric acid, a food-grade acid, to lower the acidity of the mash, and then we take designated distillers yeast that has some properties that we need for the fermentation. For example, this yeast uh, ferments up to a very high alcoholic content, usually above 10%. Your normal baker's yeast would stop at 4 or 5% alcohol. And then we let this ferment. So we take our prepared mesh out of the, out of the juicer, out of the smoothie maker, and we do put it in fermentation tanks. Fermentation tanks is basically stainless steel, glass, plastics, whatever. It's just a bucket, basically. Then you add yeast to this bucket of fermented spirits. You try to control the temperature. The yeast always has an optimal temperature that uh, it works best. So. Usually it's 15 to 22 degrees, sometimes uh, in late August when you've got your fruits just in harvest times, it's still too warm, so you need another yeast that is more active at, let's say, 25 to 27 degrees. Then you need an airlock on this fermentation because uh, fermentation generates CO2, CO2 and a lot of it. And this needs to get out, but Oxygen should not get into the yeast because then we get another type of fermentation that doesn't produce alcohol. So we need an airlock, and this airlock lets the carbon dioxide get out, but no uh, oxygen back in. So you check your airlocks. And then you double check your airlocks. Because every distiller that says his fermentation tank didn't blow up on him once or twice is a liar. This happens all the time. And then we ferment this mash for about two weeks, so we have the smoothie, we add yeast, the yeast does its work, and then we have a smoothie that contains around 10% alcohol after two weeks. The bubbles is the CO2 that is uh, evaporating, and if we don't have any more bubbles, so then our fermentation is complete. And then we try to distill it as soon as possible after fermentation, because a fully fermented mash is not getting better with time. And then we come to the part, um, for example, a small fermentation tank we see here, it's just 10 liters. We have this tiny airlock where the CO2 can bubble out via this uh, water, water uh, filling, but no oxygen can go back in. So this is something you basically can do everywhere at home. And if you got this fermented mesh, we come to the distillation. Distillation itself is just a physical process, a physical means of separation of liquids and solids and of concentrating alcohol in that matter or um, taste and scent. Because the boiling point of alcohol is lower than the boiling point of water or uh, the solids don't boil at all. So if we heat up this mesh, the alcohol will start evaporating sooner than the water and so we fill the mesh in the still, we heat it up, and as soon as the still gets to around 70 degrees centigrade, the, alcoholic, uh, the alcohol starts to evaporate, rising with it the molecules that make up the scent of the spirit that we want to distill. So it's basically essential oils, aldehydes, esters, some ketones. Um, but yeah, uh, stuff that evaporates, and then we cool it down again at the condenser, so the alcoholic vapor that we just produced by heating up is uh, going to the condenser, then cooled down, so it liquefies again, and it goes down, and basically we have our distilled spirit. Then we can cut off heads and tails and hearts. This is basically three parts of the distillate that we get. The heads parts are the earliest uh, evaporating parts. These are uh, short alcohols that are aldehydes that we do not want. For example, methanol is among them. Those are slightly toxic. I just say they're not actually that toxic. They're just bad for your health. 
and they taste like like uh, uh, like solvent. And the taste, the tails, they start to uh, smell and taste like like cellar, foul, foul flavor. So we don't want those flavors in our spirit. So we cut it into heads, hearts, and tails. Those hearts, those fine tasting, uh, fine tasting alcoholic part, we keep, we collect, and then we redistill these ones to get even to get rid of even more of the heads and the tail parts that might still be in the first heart part. So. This is a laboratory still. This still you could buy in an online shop, in any laboratory device shops, 500 milliliter. It is still legal. You can do this at home until the day after tomorrow. Then those get, uh, then those get forbidden. So you can't buy them anymore. So if you do want to have one, go to the local uh, drug or the laboratory uh, uh, dealer. Uh, here I can quickly demonstrate how this works. So we've got the heater here. It's just, uh, just propylene gas uh, going up. Here we've got our mesh inside. The alcohol evaporates, goes up, goes into the condenser. The condenser cools it down, and the distillate com comes out here again. Here just in a quick schematics, but uh, same principle. And this is just stuff that you could basically buy almost everywhere where laboratory equipment is sold. As said, until the day after tomorrow. From 2018 on, all home stills in Germany will be illegal. So you can buy one in the next three days, and you can still use it in 2018, but you can't buy any more of them from 1st of January on, or 2nd of January on. So, we have one exception. You can buy stills of up to two liters of size, if they're only used for the production of essential oils or distillation of water. But the basic physical principle stands. <laughs> but don't buy this stuff online and don't buy it anywhere where someone will register your address because that's what they're legally obliged to do. Obliged to do. Any vendor of distills has to register your name and address by the tax office, which gives us back to the hacking aspect we're going to see later on about building stills, which is totally illegal, by the way. <laughs> don't do that. But there's one exception. And this, I have to say, uh, we, we're leaving now the, the part of the home distilling, unfortunately. We have to go semi-pro if we want to continue distilling uh, brandies. You can go craft distilling. Craft distilling, on the other hand, is far more easy to do from 2018 on than it used to be until well, the day after tomorrow. A lot of things change. Our precious Brandweinsteuergesetz is basically gone out of business because of the EU. Thanks, Brussels. But we get the new Alkoholsteuergesetz. And the Alkoholsteuergesetz is actually quite nice for craft distillers. Because if you fulfill the requirements that this law states, you are legally obliged to get this distillation license. Until now, you can apply for one, but if you don't get, if you don't get one of those Brandweinrechte, Brennrechte, so this, this uh, well, uh, the right to distill at the moment, well, you can start. From 2018 on, you must get one if you apply for one and if you fulfill the requirements. This is called Abfindungsbrennen because it's basically um, you compensate the state for the tax of the alcohol that you're going to produce. Until now, the Abfindungsbrennen is only in the southern parts of uh, Germany, so Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg, uh, parts of Hessen, so not in the north, not in the east. The background is... Uh, uh, no, now you can do it in the whole of Germany, so everywhere where you are, you can apply for an Abfindungsbrennrecht. Background is, if you are a farmer or even a part-time farmer, the state allows you to distill this amount of alcohol. This is a usual craft still. This is uh, ours. 
It's from the 70s. It's not very high-tech, but it gets the job done. And you can buy or build something comparable to this. This has a size of about 150 liters. Uh, in the future, the size and uh, the quantity of the stills is no longer regulated, so you can basically buy any still of any size that you want from 2018 on. So, this Abfindungsbrennerei allows you to produce 300 liters of pure alcohol per year. That doesn't sound much, but actually it is, because it's liters pure alcohol. Who of us cons consumes the pure alcohol? We water it down and we sell it in tiny bottles. So, if you divide it by 0.4 for the 40% for the, for the brandy, and by 0.5, because we only have half a liter bottles, then we get 1,500 bottles per year allowance. You have to drink that, or you have to sell that. And then there's even another thing, we get an allotment. So we could produce 900 liters in one year if we then don't produce any more in the two following years. There's only one uh, a small uh, cut. You can only make fruit or grain spirit, no molasses. So no rum and no chunk. I'm sorry. But, as said, you need to be a farmer or a part-time farmer. Well, that's actually not so hard. You need three hectares of uh, regular tree orchards or you need 1.5 hectares of intensively farmed fruit orchards. This is the one thing that maybe will hold back most of you guys thinking about opening an Abfindungsbrennerei. But there's a tiny way around it. Cheat code. You can rent or lease it. And you can rent or lease it any time in the next 10 years, and you have only to show it once to your customs. And when the custom guy then has checked your, your mark that you owned or rented or leased, then you're good to go forever. So there's going to be some, some areas of three hectares that are going to get uh, leased for 365 days per year to 365 guys. <laughs> the other exception is it has to be uh, mixed fruit trees or intensely farmed fruit trees. Well, that's also a cheat code because there's one fruit or one bulb that you can grow that is allowed and that you don't see, and that is no tree that you need to plant and wait for five years or so. This is the Jerusalem artichoke, or Topinambur, very well known in Baden-Württemberg. This one can be planted anywhere, and you can just, you know, rent any area of just three hectares, like, like grassland, like, like a forest, like a jungle, and you say, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to plant some Jerusalem artichoke. And the customs agent has to say, yeah, of course you do. Then we have another requirement. This might be a bit tricky for some of us, or for some of you, because I have an Abfindungsbrennerecht. You have to have a clean sheet in taxation. So if you cheated on your taxes once, you're not going to get the Abfindungsbrennerecht in the future. The next is you have to have an economic interest in producing. Well, but this is just, this is just uh, what we say, a paper tiger. Because if I have an economic interest of uh, giving Andreas a bottle of liquor, then my economic interest is fulfilled. So this is uh, not a requirement per se. Um, the taxation rate, this one liter of pure alcohol that you're going to produce, you have to pay the state a tax for it. And this tax is a reduced uh, one of 10 euros, 22 cents per liter pure alcohol. So if you have your 300 liters pure alcohol, you know how much tax you're going to pay for it. And um, just as an example, how much of apples, pears, or plums or so you're going to need. Um, there's a list of these Ausbeutesätze, so, so uh, a calculated result from certain uh, mash. And for apples, we have 3.6 liters of pure alcohol for 100 liters of apple mash, so we can calculate how many apples you have to buy or have to use if you want to get your 300 liters. Then, uh, 
this is it's maybe this is maybe not the best for you privacy aware guys out there because if you own a still and if you've got a, a licensed Abfindungsbrennerei, then the federal customs agents are allowed to check the still every day, every night, whenever they choose fit. The next is the food inspectors have the right to check your still, but uh, they only come on business hours, so that's a bit better. And then you need to enter a professional's association called Berufsgenossenschaft, either for the farming industry or the, for the food service industry, because if you blow yourself up while operating a still, then you're at least insured. Which brings us to the uh, safety issues of operating a still, because, uh, well, accidents happen, and they happen all the time. Usually once or twice a year, a person in southern Germany blows him or herself up because he or her didn't check the safety regulations. The most important thing about running a still is knowing that alcoholic vapor is by itself explosive. It's low grade, it's no dynamite, but it is dangerous. So you always have to check that you don't have a huge amount of alcoholic vapor just running around. So the legal stills will be checked by the technical control board, by the TÜV or DECRA, by the Berufsgenossenschaft and by customs agents for different reasons, but they are all going to check your still until you get your license to produce. And the first and foremost safety mechanism is build something that controls or that checks if your cooler is actually running. Here we have a cooler, and this cooler, as we said before, condenses the alcoholic vapor back to liquids. If it's not working, we don't get a liquid, we get the vapor straight, uh, straight out of the hole. The vapor of alcohol is heavier than air, so it goes down on the surface, and then you just need some igniting spark and you get blown up. So the most important thing that the Berufsgenossenschaft and the TÜV is going to check, do you have any reason to check if your condenser is working or not? Second of all, have a good ventilation. This is usually acquired by just having it uh, ground floor and opening a big door, and then you have natural ventilation. If there are alcoholic vapors, uh, not rising, but uh, uh, existing, that are going to just diffuse outside in the air and fresh air, and this, uh, this danger is then compensated. And the third is, if you use electrical equipment within one meter of the still, make sure it's uh, according to the ATEX, the anti-explosive uh, whatever uh, certification. Usually that's made... Um, uh, usually we do this by using only uh, compressed air valves, for example, because compressed air does not ignite any sparks, and so we don't, we don't ha have the, the um, danger of exploding. So, so much for uh, safety. Now about the economics, because, as I said, you're a part-time farmer now, and this doesn't come for free. If you buy a new still by one of the established German coppersmiths, this still will cost between 25 and 45,000 euros. You need to sell a lot of those 1,500 bottles per year to get this back. The alternative is, of course, buy a, new, uh, buy a used still. Those are a lot cheaper. You even get them refurbished, like MacBooks. So they are actually checked again by the, by the producer and uh, those is a really, really good alternative. You can also buy in Far East. I wouldn't recommend that. Did that, got the T-shirt. Or you could build one yourself. But please don't do these US-style moonshine stills that you see in the moonshine forums or so. Do one like this, where uh, Andrea San Francisco is telling you about later on. The energy costs. If you heat up a still of a 150 liter, and if you do this five or six times a day, as you can, you have about 100 euros of energy consumption. Uh, 100 euros you need to get into energy consumption per 100 liter uh, per still per day, which equals around 15 euros per 100 liter mesh. 
tax is around 40 euros of alcohol tax per 100 liter mesh. And if you calculate all this together and divide it by 1,500 bottles, and then you take it about eight years, or what you, what you say about this is your usual, uh, your usual investment calculation time, then you will need to charge at least 20 euros per bottle for a, a liquor from our Abfindungsbrennerei to reach the break even. So I see a lot of uh, a farmers market spirits that sell their booze for 10, 12, 14 euros. There's a saying in our in, in us, uh, distillers uh, circles: if you do this, you could also just you know take a five euro note and put it on the head of the bottle because you're, you're cutting your own throat. So if you want to start uh, Abfindungsbrennerei. First, don't panic. This is something that's done for ages, and now you can do that too. Check the online resources at the customs uh, office. Uh, but I have to admit, some pages at the customs office are according to the old law, some are already to the new law, so maybe check uh, again in a couple of months, or just call the customs agents. I mean, it's their job to help you doing this. They don't want to hinder you, they want to help you. But don't try to screw them over. Those are people, those are professionals that are doing their job. If you call them, and if you meet with them, then they're gonna be happy to help you. Then check the details on what still you want to build or to buy, always according and in coordination with the customs agents or with the uh, guys at the Berufsgenossenschaft, the Professionals Association, and then you can basically apply for this Abfindungsbrennricht. As I said, if you fulfill the regulations, they have to give you this license. Then, as I said, Berufsgenossenschaft is the way to talk, and then you might check in with the local farmers club or organic farmers club, or for example, the University of Hohenheim has really good distillers classes because it's one thing of reading something in a book, it's something totally different to actually take part in a course. Such a course sets you back another three, four hundred euros, but it's money well spent because if you ruin a batch of 1,000 kilos of apples, that's going to be more expensive. Yeah, and this is basically the end of my talk. Here's the Marte Liqueur receipt that I wanted to show you, because if you don't want to apply for an Abfindungsbrennrecht, and although it can be done, it is quite a hassle, it is easier just to aromatize uh, using uh, a neutral grain spirits. So here's the recipe. You take uh, acarose root, you take some coriander seeds, some Marte tea leaves, you talc, take galangal root, some cinnamon, some cardamom, you just uh, mix it with 200 milliliters of 50% vodka and let it simmer, let it, uh, let it just stand for 10 days, filter it through a tea filter, then you have a Marte liqueur macerate, and this macerate is basically a concentrate you make your liqueur out of, and then you mix it again with 1.4 liters of vodka, half a liter of water, 500 grams of sugar, mix it, maybe uh, filter it again through the tea filter, and then you have your delicious Marte liqueur. And this is basically the end of my talk. So thanks a lot. A warm welcome. Warm thanks for Stefan Peininger for this double feature start.